The views expressed in this interview are those of the individuals and do not reflect the official policy or position of the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, or the Naval Postgraduate School. On behalf of the NPS Alumni Association, Association, I would like to welcome you to this presentation. My name is Rich Patterson and I serve as the CEO of the NPS Alumni Association Foundation. Our organization exists for the purpose of supporting research, research facilities, the alumni and student and faculty communities at NPS. The importance of U.S. Special Operations will continue to grow in the years ahead and today we're privileged to have highly experienced and respected speakers with us. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Colonel Todd Lyons. Todd currently serves as the Vice President for the NPS Alumni Association Foundation and is a volunteer instructor for innovation leadership at the Naval Postgraduate School. In these roles, he bridges the divide between industry, academia, and DOD entities to accelerate the responsiveness of NPS to the challenges arising from great power competition and emerging technology. Todd retired last year after 30 years in the Marine Corps and served as the Senior Marine Representative and the Associate Dean of Research at NPS in his final assignment. Todd, over to you. Rich, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here today with uh, Admiral Olson and Colonel John Crisavulli to talk about special operations, both in the transition from um, both counterterrorism in the past, more recently into great power competition. We're also going to be discussing the transition that that's placed uh, and the hardship that's placed on our special operations forces and the dynamic environment in which they serve. It is now my honor uh, to introduce Admiral Eric Olson, who retired from the Navy after 38 years of active service. In his last assignment, he served as the commander of Special Operations Command from 2007 to 2011. Admiral Olson is now president of the ETO Group, consulting on national security and adjunct professor at Columbia University and the director, a director of the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and the Naval Postgraduate School. Over to you, Admiral Olson. Thanks very much, Todd and uh, Ed Rich. Thanks for, for inviting me in. Uh, it's great to be with you. But let me, let me begin today by talking about what Special Operations forces actually are. The principal missions of Special Operations Forces are direct action, the raids and assaults, the capture and kill uh, kinds of operations, uh, very kinetic in nature, combating terrorism, which has received obviously a, an awful lot of attention over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, foreign internal defense, this is a, a flavor of counterinsurgency. It is, it is raising the game of a foreign partner to uh, to, to challenge those forces that may be trying to overthrow it. Uh, it is unconventional warfare, which is the reverse of that. It's actually training those who want to overthrow a government uh, to do that if we deem that government to be hostile or illegitimate. Special reconnaissance, uh, bringing back intelligence from, for force protection or for targeting purposes. The military information support operations, which I call truth telling for a purpose. Its, uh, its mission is to, is to convey truths uh, of mutual benefit uh, to our to foreign partners and, uh, and to the adversaries, uh, not mutual benefit to the adversaries, but information that we, when received by the adversary works to the advantage of our and our partners' military mission. Civil affairs, again, which is generally building, bringing assistance, uh, in places that need it, that's, that's often to repair damage, make up for something that we've uh, done uh, to, to damage an area or to build a long-term lasting relationship. It includes information operations, transmitting a, a, a message generally through electronic means. It includes counter proliferation of weapons of mass uh, destruction, uh, nuclear, chemical, or or biological, and then there are a number of collateral activities like coalition support, combat search and rescue, and counter drug and counter mine activities. More recently, counter messaging uh, and adversaries 
uh, propaganda and uh, countering terrorist threat financing, trying to disrupt the, the chains that they use to fund their uh, activities. The challenges of the force are many. First and uh, foremost, finding the right people uh, to be in it. It does require volunteers multiple times who are able, not just willing, but able to pass through uh, multiple filters uh, in order to serve in the force and hopefully for a long time. Uh, the best operators, in my view, in the special operations community are in their 30s. They've got the experience, uh, the wisdom, uh, to, and the training. Uh, to do the right things on the battlefield. They can run missions that, uh, and we find that on, on most of our missions, the, uh, the average age of the operator in the platoon and the squad uh, in the cockpit is somewhere between 30 and 35, sometimes a bit younger, sometimes a bit older, but we recruit them uh, to be there a long time. Uh, they do operate more remotely. Uh, their operations are more sensitive. Uh, they're more ambiguous. They do require a higher level of problem solving. They require a higher level of security. The fights are generally more close quartered. Uh, they're less likely to, to get bit, hit by a bomb or an IUD and more likely to be shot at uh, at close quarters. Uh, and they have to be close to their teammates. Uh, once in a tactical unit, they tend to stay for a long time so that they can intuitively uh, fill in for each other's uh, shortfalls and, and amplify their strengths. They do have a higher per capita casualty rate uh, than other forces. And over the last few years, as most of our country begins to think that we wound down uh, the fight, certainly special operations forces have been heavily engaged in Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria, and of the US military casualties over the last couple of years, about two thirds. Uh, have been from the special operations community, even though they only constitute about 3% of the uniform military force. Uh, it does require total trust. It requires sometimes even secrecy from family. It requires more training time away from home. So, so this is a, a physically demand, psychologically demanding work. Uh, and another sort of challenge is the impact still unknown of all of this in the in the longest uh, wars uh, that we have fought. So that leads me to to sort of transition it over to to John to Colonel John Christopher uh, When I was a commander of Special Operations Command, I I testified to Congress four years in a row on the condition of the force, and in each of those testimonies, I I used the term that the the force was the fabric of the force was solid, but it was beginning to fray around the edges after so many years of combat and back to back to back to back to back to back, to back uh, deployments. Uh, seeing so many casualties, so many friends uh, who who didn't come back or came back injured, and, and Congress finally asked me, "What do you mean uh, when you say frayed around the edges?" and and I didn't have a, a ready answer. I, I had sort of an anecdotal, intuitive kind of response, but I thought I should put more behind it. The commanders were generally telling me the force was ready, but we got a different message from the spouses, from the kids, uh, from friends. Uh, and so we conducted a, a survey, a comprehensive survey that I thought would take 90 days. It ended up taking nine months. We asked kids about their parents, spouses about each other's, juniors about seniors, seniors about their subordinates. We asked teachers about uh, the kids of the service members in school. We realized that the data that we were collecting was wrong. It wasn't inaccurate, it was just wrong for our purposes. And so as an example, we knew how many divorces the force was suffering, but we didn't know how many separations short of divorce were occurring. It turned out to be a significant number. We knew how many suicides were happening, but we didn't know how many close attempts uh, to suicide were happening. We knew how much domestic abuse was reported to police, but we didn't know how much domestic abuse wasn't. Uh, we didn't know how many kids were failing out of school. Uh, we didn't know a lot of the things that we needed to know in order to properly manage uh, the force. And so the survey turned out to be quite powerful as we began to collect information, not data. And uh, I called that project the, 
the pressure on the force and family task force. And, uh, and as it was completed, I was leaving my four years of command. I read it, was uh, understood the power of this information, turned it over to my successor, Admiral Bill McRaven, also a proud graduate of the Naval Force Graduate School. And, uh, and he changed it from pressure on the force and family task force, which was a study to preservation of the force and family project uh, in order to address many of these concerns that we had identified. And uh, it's an ongoing effort, a significant effort. It's had impact across the force uh, under the leadership of Admiral McRaven and his three successors uh, since, since he was a commander of Special Operations Command. And with that, I'll, I'll finish up and turn it over to, turn it back to, to Todd Lyons. Thank you. Sir, thank you for your remarks. Uh, that was great context for understanding the world in which uh, the Special Forces uh, community and the Special Operations community writ large lives. Um, as you set the context for how much the force is being used and the kinds of operation in which it's being used. Uh, I'd also highlight that very often special operations is a leading indicator for some of the concerns that are in the broader DOD as well. So um, th there is that, uh, that component to this conversation. Uh, I do want to turn it over to Colonel John Chris Bully, uh, currently the Special Operations Command Chair at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. In his previous assignment, he served as the Director of Special Operations Advisory Group and the Operations Officer in support of Operation Inherent Resolve under the Special Operations Joint Task Force. Uh, Colonel Chris Fooley is a graduate of Tulane University and the United States Army War College. Uh, and again, John, really look forward to hearing you kind of bring it up into the modern context and the evolution of that preservation of the force and family into the operations that you are leading today. John? Hey, thank you, Todd. And thank you, Admiral Olson, too, uh, for setting the stage. I think uh, for a little bit about me, for the group, it's been uh, over 25 years now I've been in the, in the service uh, on active duty. Um, and 21 of that has been special operation. So my responsibilities here is uh, a curriculum we have. It is the uh, defense analysis department where we hold a 18 month uh, graduate program, masters of science uh, for special operations forces. Uh, what were our niche here is it's a regular warfare is what we study on and we have our students work through. And currently, uh, you know, with the COVID environment taking place, a little bit of distance learning going on, but we're hoping that the, after the, uh, the holidays, we're, we're back to normal here in class. And we see with those 160 students um, on campus here across the range. I gotta mention too, aside from the US Special Operation Forces, we also have international, which range about 20% of our folks that come, uh, come to the course. And for us in the Special Operations community, relationships are a really big deal. It's kind of how we get a lot of our work done. Uh, and having those international students that, that graduate here, many of them become senior leaders in their country uh, within the Special Operations, uh, some of the conventional and some uh, significantly high up in the government as well. So we have those contacts and educate them as they go through. Uh, so what do we do with our students here for 18 months? Uh, you know, the regular warfare is our, is our main venue of what we're studying on. But uh, I tell you, we, we, we create, uh, we look at advanced critical thinking and problem solving skills and communication as well. Uh, and you'll see that uh, several of the individuals that graduate here, Emeralds being one of them, have uh, some pretty incredible careers that, that, that continue. So the, the main purpose I want to talk about today is uh, the Human Enhancement uh, Research Group. Uh, and with that, it's a, uh, we're going from concept to tangible here and what we're looking at. But the, um, what we have is, is, is our soldiers and officers that come here. On average, uh, 55 to 60% come here with combat related injuries uh, that, uh, you know, they, they have 18 months, and we can work with them to get that, get them fixed. So we're talking like, you know, in terms of improve individual performance, facilitate a quicker return to duty, enhance uh, the professional mindset. It's a holistic look that we're going to be taking place here um, you know, from the cognitive side to the physical side. So if, if you could picture what we're, we're, I have in front of in my mind here, um, I have an umbrella on top of this and it's an applied research center. Uh, and underneath this applied research center, there's uh, the venue for the holistic refit. And with that is, the, uh, is a physical performance center, basically a gym, the human performance coach to work with her 
with our soldiers is a um, life strategy counseling center. And in there we work, uh, you know, talking about a licensed clinical social worker, psychiatrist, a psychologist, kind of work, uh, work through the life stresses that they have and, and uh, as well. And then with that, uh, another center is the Cognitive Performance Mind Gym. We're looking at enhancing and optimizing the cognitive side of our, of our uh, operators. Um, it's becoming a significant deal. If we're looking at in terms of you know, global power competition, uh, looking at a competitive advantage, and looking at the AI and the big data analysis, and look at the technology that our operators have on the ground. Um, so we have to be at a physical, high physical level. And now our technical and cognitive level is increasing with the technology on the battlefield. And we're going to develop and understand that so our, uh, our operators will be able to take on that extra cognitive load, as we call it, and uh, be able to operate. And with this also, underneath the Applied Research Center is a physical performance center, uh, which is a, is, is a big part of what we're doing. So when the, when the students show up here for the Defense Analysis Department, they have to go through a USO COM uh, test. Uh, it's appliability, flexibility test. It kind of takes a look at them and see where they're at, triggers, you know, sees their injuries and what we're doing. And what they do is they, they, um, they take the test, they go up to the physical therapy, and uh, potentially we can, we can uh, handle the issues there at the physical therapy center. Uh, if not, we tie it in Stanford Medical, they might need some surgery and come back to the physical therapy center, and then they bridge over to the physical performance center uh, where they can get work on their, um, when I say physical performance center, it's basically a, a, a CrossFit type gym out there. So the benefit of what we're doing here is the holistic refit of the students, kind of repair, reassemble them. But on top of that, using the cohort students in terms of the, of, um, the applied research. Uh, and I got to tell you, the basis of this is Adam Olson is a preservation of the force of family uh, program. So that's where we're, we're standing this up. So SOCOM is, is utilizing, as we've done, to enhance DOD. We're kind of the spearhead of this particular initiative. Uh, and we have, we have some funding and some personnel that are of the milestone is the preservation of the force of family. Uh, so as we see this, the preservation of the force of family is uh, kind of a, um, uh, right now we're able to immediately fix things. We're kind of in a reactive stance. So we're gonna utilize the Human Enhancement Research Group uh, to take a, a bigger long-term look at human enhancement and human performance and what we can do for special operation forces in order to facilitate that. Uh, so you're going to see students, so we've already started, students and faculty uh, looking in terms of human enhancement uh, and how they can benefit. How can we optimize who we are and what we do uh, utilizing technology uh, on top of the human enhancement uh, side of things. When, when we have the physical performance center, the physical therapy center, the strategy counseling center, and the cognitive performance center all under one roof. So the faculty have that collaboration over students. The students collaborate with faculty in terms of research and analysis uh, as, as we move forward. Uh, but uh, I can tell you, it's, it's well needed. And uh, the, the pressure uh, and some of the, the, the uh, stresses, I can say, and uh, some of the things that have occurred in a lot of our operators' time over the last 10 years is, is significant. Uh, and we're, we want them to come here. We want them to work on themselves, study. Uh, we want them to, uh, you know, we call it, uh, you know, basically improve their performance, uh, enhance their professional mindset. And we see the Human Enhancement Research Group, the HERG, as a means to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John, for that uh, quick overview. I guess, you know, there's, there's two related ones that I'd like you to hone in on a, a little bit. One is, you know, when you look back over the last uh, eight years, what do the operations and the deployments look like for the students that are coming in? And then the related question is, what kind of support were they getting before this, a year ago or even, or even today? You know, how is this changing the kind of support that they may have gotten in the past? Well, great question, Todd. So what we're seeing here is the, uh, our students are showing up. They've been gone a lot. Uh, on average, uh, six deployments, uh, most of them in combat zones during the last 10 years. So what, what, do you, what, do, what do we have? We have guys and, and gals that have been, uh, have been through a lot. They've been gone a lot. They've been gone from their families. Uh, they, uh, they, a lot of them got married before they started deploying, and they haven't been really at home to, to kind of uh, be, be part of a family. 
And then all of a sudden, bam, it's 18 months, you're here at post graduate school, you're, you're with your spouse, you're with your kids, or you're gonna have kids. And uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a time for, uh, you know, the, the, the mental the kind of rewind, reconnection of relationships, um, and, and uh, understand who you are, what you're about. And really the HERG is one of those venues to prepare them for, as we say, you know, the rest of their career, uh, mentally and physically. But in terms of what they had at their other units, you know, the preservation of force and family is, is throughout the SOCOM. There's, there's pockets of it in, in most special um, operations unit. Now they, they've had the ability to uh, go to see physical therapy or performance as well. But the problem is they, 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 you know, hey, I got a busted up knee. I, I go, I get looked at, um, do some physical therapy, you know, but then I got to deploy again. You know, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna hold back. My buddies are waiting on me to go. Uh, so they kick the can on that. They deploy for six months, but boy, the knee just gets tore up even more, but then they come back. They're like, okay, I'm gonna get it fixed. Bam, another deployment, out the door. So what's happening now is you come here, we're like, okay, we're gonna fix your knee uh, and uh, we're, we're gonna get you through this. And in terms of the, the we call it a, you know, cognitive dissonance, it's quite a bit. Guys, the guys and gals have been through a lot and it's a time for them to understand what they've been through and potentially they might need to kind of work through some things. So here's a place to do it. Thanks, Doug. That's awesome, John. Thank you so much. Uh, Admiral Olson, I want to go back to something that, that you had said earlier that I think ties in well with what uh, Colonel Christopher Bowie was talking about. And it was, you highlighted that not only were we not collecting good data, but we were actually collecting the wrong data and actually asking the wrong questions. As you were working on the preservation of the force and, and at that time, you know, the, the review of it, um, how did you come to understand the right questions to begin to ask? Because again, I think you were looking initially at some of those lagging indicators when the divorce happens rather than the leading indicators when the kids are starting to get in trouble and when there's problems uh, at home, perhaps before they've actually gotten into the actual system. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, but I, will, I won't take credit for designing the questions. Uh, I'll just take credit for appointing the, the commander of the task force. He was an army colonel named Tom Solzhen, uh, who had great credibility across the force. And he convened his team and they spent you know, a fair amount of time studying what questions they should ask. And they learned more every time they went out and asked questions. Uh, they, just, they learned more about what they should be scratching into and so this was an evolving thing and that's why it wasn't just a matter of you know drafting some questions and sending them out and collecting the responses this uh and that's why it wasn't 90 days it was nine months is uh is because it did require personal interaction the right way to talk uh to people and and the ability to sort of follow leads to see what the story was behind the story Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And John, you know, as you talked about the HERG, um, I'm actually very interested in the Applied Research Center. Um, that sounds like that's something that doesn't exist currently across the other preservation of the force and family initiatives. Uh, how, how does that actually, uh, um, you know, fit in with the rest of the refit and enhancing performance moving toward the future? Um. Thanks, Todd. So I'm going to talk on this a little bit, and then Commander Davis is going to uh, kind of go in a little more detail on it. But I can tell you, uh, for the audience, uh, the, the regular warfare curriculum here, you know, it, it's not done anywhere else. Uh, the cohort we have of special operations here is nowhere else ever to be found. Uh, and one of the benefits of, of special operations forces is they are intuitive and they like uh, complex problem solving. Uh, so we're going to tap into that through the applied research that's going to be taking place in the human enhancement research group within the HERG. Uh, and with that is to uh, understand and create and enable recommendations and training tools uh, for the human enhancement, for the, the increasing the performance of our special operators uh, down the road. Uh, Commander Justin Davis, do you have anything you'd like to add on this? So yes, sir, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, to join in the discussion here. 
Um, for the audience who I haven't met, um, Commander Justin Davis, I'm the SEAL Community Senior Representative to the, uh, to the, uh, to the school here. Um, so work primarily in the Defense Analysis Department, although we have students in other departments as well. Um, but I think in terms of the applied research and how it would um, uh, sit within the Human Enhancement Research Group, um, what we're actually talking about is a kind of a, a human capital opportunity. Um, and so the, 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 the refit part of it takes care of, it heals, it returns our, 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 our soft professionals to fitness for duty. Um, but what it does in terms of the applied research uh, opportunity is, is it takes it and it points that human capital in a, in a very meaningful and strategic direction. Um, and so our students have been doing research projects in this domain but it, they haven't been integrated and they haven't necessarily had the resources uh, in terms of facilities and expertise, local expertise uh, to really unify it and point it in a, in a way that is coherent and efficient. And so uh, we have a couple of uh, research projects going on right now. Um, one aligned with Stanford Neuroscience looking at cognitive performance. Um, one under the uh, leadership of our uh, human systems integration department looking at um, breathing regulation techniques and not just the uh, immediate impacts, but actually using wearables um, that to get kind of longitudinal information to, to look at the outcomes from some of these non-standard uh, rehabilitation techniques. Um, and then we also have students looking at uh, just uh, physical performance enhancement, um, looking at it from both an ethical and from a uh, technological standpoint. Uh, and what these all, what themes kind of unify all of these um, is that uh, our students are not uh, uneducated uh, or say um, situationally uninformed um, researchers or consultants. Um, they already have 100% of the context of the problems that they're, that they're looking to tackle. Um, the other thing that they have is time. Um, they're off the, the continuous uh, you know, sp you know, spinning treadmill of the training and deployment uh, readiness cycle. Um, and then the third piece they have is motivation. They're the ones that are going to inherit the results of their own research. And so uh, really with the herd, what we're looking to do is, is to integrate and sort of strategically direct these opportunities for research that this, um, this human capital, this potential, this ball of potential, um, which is uh, contextually savvy, um, they have the time and they have the motivation to dive in on these topics. Um, the herd really just is here to give it shape uh, and, to, and to really help uh, accelerate uh, the efforts that our students are already looking into. Uh, you, you know, the point you bring up on, you know, the, the is happening. So hey, let's bring it together. Let's, let's go look across campus here in terms of the, the human enhancement and uh, work that's already taking place, the spaces that's already been working on and work through it here to make some advancements, kind of a, uh, you know, a larger team effort. John, thank you so much. That was, uh, you know, kind of a great really scoping for what the Human Enhancement Research Group is going to be doing that's, that's unique and different. You know, thank you. And, and Admiral Olson, you know, thinking through your own experience, um, when you were, you know, Commander of Special Operations Command and then before that as the Deputy, uh, were there any examples of where you made a step in the Special Operations community and then those capabilities became the standard capabilities of the general purpose forces? And, and how did you see that evolve over time? Yeah, thanks, John. That was always the desire. Uh, the, the budget uh, for special operations is intended to be used on those things that are peculiar to special operations, but it was always the desire to use that budget to develop things uh, that, that, if appropriate, would transition uh, into big Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. And it was a good partnership. They were happy to let us do that. We're a good control, the Special Operations Forces are a great control group uh, for experimentation. They're Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, they're active reserve, they're civilian, they're from under the ocean into space, they're in every geographic region, every terrain, every climate uh, on Earth. And, and so they tend to be, and they tend to be good problem solvers, uh, aggressive thinkers uh, in terms of how they approach uh, complex situations. And, and so I, I think that the service, the big services were happy to let special operations do that because it was always visible to them. I mean, it, unless it was particularly classified uh, as internal to soft, which wasn't much, 
uh, it was always visible to them and, and available to them should they decide it's something for them. So much of the equipment uh, that was developed within special operations for tactical operations has transitioned out uh, into the big services. Much of the communications uh, capability has transitioned out to the big uh, services. Some of the standard operating procedures themselves uh, have transitioned out into the uh, into the big services. And, uh, and so I, I think that this is, you know, we tend to use the term in our community, I don't mean to get bureaucratic here, but things are either common to the services or specialized uh, to special operations services, but almost nothing is completely one or the other. Uh, the special operations forces use a lot. Their capability is almost doubled by contributions from the big services. And, uh, and the big services are often uh, adopting many of the ideas that, that were developed within Special Operations Forces. Sure, fantastic. And, and that really uh, kind of puts another note on, um, you know, one of the follow-up questions that we received was really thinking through this connection between the emerging technology uh, that Justin Davis was talking about with uh, the wearables, the ability to actually get far better and more granular data and then to apply some of those data analytic capabilities uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School to, to answer some of those problem sets. Um, you know, as we, again, think about what the future holds, um, I know a lot of our efforts are growing out of current efforts in the human systems integration curriculum and things that they're drawing from the modeling and virtual environments, from computer science, those that are focused on the Internet of Things, and even the 5G technologies that bring all of these, uh, you know, efforts together. Uh, I will note that this is the third in our series where we looked at space, we've looked at information operations. And so this, again, really strides a number of different uh, domains. JD, uh, Commander Davis, if I could, can you say a couple of words about some of the efforts that the human systems integration uh, department has already been doing in this regard? Yes, sir. I think um, they've done a lot of work um, in terms of looking at protocols for uh, rest and recovery, um, and then also for um, tactical decision making uh, under under duress or the, the impacts of stress uh, on decision making. And uh, what we see as uh, a really a great opportunity uh, is as part of the uh, Human Enhancement Research Group uh, is to really build on what they've been doing um, and then apply uh, some additional modeling and simulation technologies, um, really looking to get immersive uh, in, um, in with some AR, VR type technologies with some of the biofeedback uh, and looking at not just um, performance in the, uh, in the moment, but then uh, and benchmarking that both physical performance and cognitive performance um, but then also being able to study longitudinally um, with a lot of with the commercially available wearable tech now um, to look at what happens in preparation for be um, benchmark and baseline events and in recovery from them um, and really start to look whole person uh, in a way that's already been kind of uh, adapted by certain uh, clinics in the military um, to look at multidisciplinary approaches to um, multidisciplinary and often comorbid challenges and problems when it comes to um, behavior and nutrition and exercise uh, and uh, psychological and cognitive preparation. Um, so really looking to build on what the human, or human systems integration department and lab has been doing uh, and then to take that uh, a whole nother, you know, uh, step forward. Fantastic. Thanks, JD. And I want to pivot uh, slightly because something that was mentioned earlier uh, by both uh, Admiral Olson and Colonel Chris Foley is not only the, the breadth of places in which they operate, but also um, within defense analysis, the number of uh, soldiers and others from foreign partner forces. Uh, I was going to ask uh, Admiral Olson, uh, you studied national security affairs at MPS in 1985 with an emphasis on the Middle East and Africa. How did that educational experience, you know, shape your understanding of the world, the role of special operations? And then you were involved, obviously, in, in combat in Mogadishu. You know, so how did that experience shape your understanding of the world and prepare you for the kinds of jobs you were going to do later on? 
first of all, I, I think at the, at the very immediate level, uh, I had a sort of a, a couple of shots at the Naval Postgraduate School because I had a job in between uh, that I had to go away for for a couple of years. By the time I got back to finish my time at Naval Postgraduate School, I knew what my follow-on assignment was. It was going to be in the embassy in Tunisia, North Africa. And so I was able to, to actually write my thesis at Postgraduate School on Tunisia after Bordiba, uh, the man who had been the president there at the time for 30 years. And, uh, and then when I was in Tunisia, I actually saw my thesis play out. Bordiba uh, was replaced in a coup by his prime minister. And so the direct application of that, where all of a sudden in the embassy in Tunisia, I'm the guy who studied, uh, who wrote a thesis about what Tunisia would be like after Bourguiba was deposed, uh, was directly uh, relevant and extraordinarily uh, helpful. Uh, more at the strategic level, uh, you know, studying the Middle East and Africa in the height of the Cold War uh, caused me to realize that that there were strategically important places well beyond our current focus. And, and I have since talked about that a lot. And in, in, in fact, my, my sort, of, uh, sort of iconic image for me is the, the photograph of Earth, the composite photograph of Earth taken by satellites at night that shows where the lights are on and, and where they aren't. And, and back then, you know, before the end of the Cold War, we, the United States military, we were almost totally focused on where the lights are on at night, this sort of mid-tier of the Northern Hemisphere. Our friends were in that band, think NATO, uh, some Asian uh, allies, uh, our adversaries and rising adversaries were in that band, think the Soviet Union and rising uh, communist uh, China. We studied their orders of battle. We studied their equipment. We learned their languages, and we knew almost nothing about the Middle East or Africa. And then it turned out a few years later, and ever since then, uh, most of the threats coming at us are coming at us from where the lights aren't on so bright at night, where borders are less secure, where airports are more porous, where vast expanses of territory are undergoverned, and and allows for the recruitment of and training of, of people who are sort of anti-societal in, in some of their behaviors. And, and so it really set the stage, I think, for me, uh, for everything that happened uh, after the Berlin Wall came down. And, uh, and, and so it was enormously important uh, experience. Sure, thank you. That that's actually fantastic. I had not heard that before. And uh, I, I think taking away that theme of, you know, focusing on where the lights are not is uh, a very good way of thinking about the world in which we exist. Uh, John, I wanted to kind of follow on with what uh, Admiral Olson was just talking about in terms of our foreign partner forces. Um, we have a number of international students that are in the defense analysis program. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? And also, how do we leverage that in order to build what is really a global soft community? Uh, sure, Todd. So on average, uh, about 20% uh, of our students have, have last 10 years have been international students, which has been, been invaluable to us. Um, I got a list in front of me of uh, 25 countries, you know, everywhere from Albania, Ukrainian, Cameroon, uh, Taiwan, Jamaica, Switzerland, Bangladesh, Tunisia, uh, it's quite a few. And, and uh, so one of the, you know, we talked about a little bit about you know, regarding the great power competition as we, as we move forward here on, you know, what's, what's the soft role going to be? And, you know, as we look at it and these contested geographies and the, you know, terrorist transnational criminal threats as they're still remaining. So basically, in a great turn, great, great power competition, we're, we're going to continue to do regular warfare as we've done now. Just kind of how and where and when is a little bit different. But, but getting to my point here is the more relationships we have with our partner forces, it enables us to get after uh, some of these problem sets that we see that are going to take place. Um, so in the SOF community, you don't, you don't join SOF if you have problems working with other countries, other international problems. We love it. We love sitting down with our, our partners in their countries and 
uh, eating food with them and training them or maybe going to their houses. And, 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 uh, and then well, a lot of times we actually go, we fight alongside them. Uh, and the relationships we build in the postgraduate school, they're just, they're just part of that. Uh, so uh, I've been in situations where I've been able to, uh, hey, I'm gonna deploy to country X um, and uh, believe it or not, either I might have known somebody there already who's in a role that I need to meet with, or somebody I know knows them, and they put me in touch with them. And just that little bit of connection, it opens up the window to get so many things done, uh, and it's, it's invaluable. Uh, and we, we foster that here uh, in the defense analysis program as well as throughout the Naval Postgraduate School. So as I see it, uh, hey, the more international students we have, I think it makes it better the program and helps develop our students even more so. John, thank you so much. Uh, this has just been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, Sir Admiral Olson, thank you so much for being here uh, and providing that context. Sir, did you want to say a, a, another note? I, I do, yeah. You didn't ask this question, but, but let me put it in my, my context. Uh, and, and some of this sounds like weird science when you're talking about meditation and nutrition and exoskeletons and rings around the head. Uh, it, it, it just sounds odd. Uh, so let me put it in the way I think about it. And, and these are just my thoughts, but it's, it's, uh, it's almost cliche within the special operations community that, uh, that, the, that the big forces tend to man the equipment and it requires a lot of skill training to develop the skill to operate the equipment the way the equipment is designed to be operated. The counterpart is within the special operations community, we tend to equip the man or the woman. The primary platform in the special operations community is the human being. And, and if you look at the at real platforms, at hardware platforms, uh, there is a continuous effort to use every available science and technology to improve the performance of those platforms so that airplanes can turn tighter, fly faster, submarines can detect enemies, so all those things to enhance the performance of those platforms. And this is merely an exploration of the sciences and technologies available to enhance the performance of our platform, the, the human being. And, uh, and I think it's enormously important that we not ignore any potential science or technology uh, that will make our the special operations uh, warriors uh, more capable to conduct their missions and look after each other. Sir, sure, that was a fantastic uh, way to end up uh, what has really been a, a fascinating conversation today. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, let me turn it over to Rich Patterson to take us out. Thank you very much, Todd. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you to all our speakers, uh, Admiral Olson, Colonel Chris Foley, Commander Davis. Really appreciate your time today. Uh, appreciate the audience uh, uh, here with us. And, and uh, they, uh, for those that, that are not involved in, in military, uh, were able to get an inside look at, at the, uh, uh, the human beings behind our special forces and, and uh, the challenges they have and how NPS is really uh, doing some great work to lead the way to, uh, as Colonel Chris Foley said, not only work on rehab and refit, but help develop them physically, cognitively. Uh, and, and if I could just for a moment want to say uh, how uh, wonderful it is from the foundation standpoint that we're able to partner uh, with NPS, uh, in this case with the, the uh, DA department and, and the work they're doing on the herd. Uh, as Colonel Chris Foley mentioned, this program ultimately is, is meant to spread out among uh, all of the students here at MPS in different ways. And, and I think when you consider uh, that, that the, the students attending here from all branches of service, the international students, uh, all those folks that are in the, uh, the Center for Homeland Defense and Security uh, are, are really some of the best of the best. And as they graduate from here and they go back into their uh, respective areas, they're going to take these skills, this training, this knowledge with them, and the ripple effect uh, for them, for all the people they lead and the people that come after them will be tremendous. So the, the foundation is really pleased to have this opportunity to help work with uh, 
uh, Colonel Christopoli, Commander Davis, and all those at NPS that are putting this program together. And, and we can't think of, of a higher priority than focusing on the people here, uh, both today and, and the you know, over a thousand students that, that uh, transfer in here each year. They'll, they'll be uh, many, many lives touched as this program gets fully built out. Uh, and, and this is something that in the long run is, is gonna have tremendous impact and, and we're really uh, grateful to be a part of it. So again, uh, Admiral Olson, thank you for your time today. Colonel Christopoli, Commander Davis, really appreciate the opportunity to have you here and, and uh, uh, provide such great content for uh, folks that are part of the foundation, part of the school. And, and I know there are quite a few of our alums are listening today as well. I uh, want to also remind everybody that uh, we'll uh, have more programs coming up and uh, please to, uh, take a look at the newsletter we send out each month, or our social media where we'll announce those. Uh, really pleased to be able to put these on and, and uh, do look forward to the time where we'll be able to do some of these in person. But for now, uh, the virtual uh, opportunity uh, gives us a, a great chance to reach out to people across the country and even around the world. So thank you, gentlemen. I want to thank Colonel Lyons for moderating another great session, and we look forward to seeing you next time. So signing off for now. Thanks, everyone.